Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Ian, and good evening again to everyone. Welcome to our sixth session in our study series on end time events, as, um, theological positions and perspectives. Um, before we go into our session, I just want to let you know that if you want to dialogue with me in between sessions, or if you want to engage with me in between sessions, it is quite appropriate. I am open and willing to have dialogue with you because I know we can't get all the information in the sessions that we do, and we can't have to get the opportunity to ask all the questions you might want to ask. So I want to let you know that I'm available, that if you want to make contact with me in between the sessions, that's very much welcome. You can do that via email, and my email address will be the poster chat, that's D-A-C-O-S-T-A-J-S-C-K-2-3 at hotmail.com. Or you can WhatsApp me at 236-424-24, or you can call me directly, 435-1163. And I will be available to answer any questions you might have or engage in any dialogue that will help to make matters a little clearer for your understanding. Because I want to make sure that we're not moving too fast, we're not getting too deep, because as I already explained from the very beginning, this is a very deep topic, and books have been written even on individual areas that we, we are discussing. So I understand that at the pace that which you might be moving, might be a little uh, too fast for some people. You might have persons who this information is relatively new to, or you might have some individuals who you know, need to get a little time to sort of, of get things digested and, and clarified and understood. So I'm just letting you know that I'm available and I would make opportunity to engage in you in between the sessions. Tonight, I also want to honor requests. That is the door recap of last week's session. Because again, that was a pretty deep session. And there were a number of passages that we tried to interpret. And I know that there will be some that have had a little difficulty in understanding some of the information that was presented or even grasping all of the information that was presented because we, we, we try to look at a number of things in relation to chapter 24. So I'm just going to give you a little brief recap, and I want to remind you that we're also preparing some notes so that if you want to request some of those notes to help you in your understanding of what we're discussing, you can request some of those notes as well. You can send an email address to myself or Reverend Ali, and we can provide you with notes in some of the sessions that have gone on before, and we will continue as we proceed to, to, to give you some you know, notations that will help you in your understanding. It may not be as comprehensive as what we are engaging in our discussion, but we will give you main points and highlight some important scripture references that you will need to look back at, and I believe that that should be able to help you. I also identified at the beginning a number of persons who have done video presentations. And I would perhaps also send you a list in the game of those persons that in between the sessions, you can take an opportunity <clears throat> to watch some of those video presentations on YouTube because they will cover a lot of the information that I am dealing with. And, and those persons will, will give you a lot of details in relation to our particular perspective. Right, so Matthew 24 is, is, is a chapter that has engaged a lot of theological discussion and debate. And it's a difficult passage to understand for many people. And that's why I'm trying to go as slowly as possible and try to make things as simple as I possibly can so that it will make life easy for those who are trying to grasp the concepts. I said that some of these concepts will be new um, for some people and the particular interpretations you may not be familiar with. But I'm, I'm happy that you are taking interest and that you want as much as possible to get a good understanding. And so I appreciate the, the fact that some people will want a recap 
for us to get a better understanding. So we have established so far then that Matthew chapter 24 is a main part of the Olivet Discourse, which Jesus is addressing two particular questions that were asked for his disciples. And he said those two questions allow two things to be developed in chapter 24, which we are examining. He, they entered the Mount of Olives and his disciples were over at the temple and were admired the beauty of the temple and drew it to Jesus' attention. And Jesus reminded them that as magnificent as that temple looks, there's going to come a time where it's going to be destroyed and not one block is going to be standing upon it. Another. The disciples want to find out when that time would be. And in the corresponding passages in, in Mark chapter 13 and in Luke chapter 21, they ask when that time will be and what were the signs that would indicate that that time is drawing near? I indicated to you that Mark and Luke just made reference to the first question, but the second question that the disciples asked was what would be the sign of his coming and the end of the world? That was significant in that they are associating his coming with the end of the world. And they are thinking that there will be signs that will indicate that. We point out to you, which we will examine tonight after I do the recap. When we look at the second theme where Jesus is responding to the second question, you will tell me if you think that he's giving signs or he is giving a different response to what they were requesting. So there are two themes then. The theme dealing with the destruction of the temple, because that's the answer that he's giving to the first question, and the theme dealing with the second coming and the end of the world. Now, there are some theologians that believe that Jesus answered the second question first. And what we are seeing in the first part of Matthew chapter 24 with all of those signs identified are signs which are related to the future, to a time that has not really happened as yet, but that these signs would be an indication that his coming is near at hand and that these are signs that we are to watch for. My interpretation of that is that, that is not correct. There's no indication given by Jesus that he was answering the second question first. We believe that he was answering the first question first. And those signs that he indicated were signs in relation to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, which occurred in AD 70. Now, I'm not going back to the list of the signs because they're there for you. You can read through the chapter and you will see all the things that he indicated, which we highlighted, and which I proceeded to show you the fulfillment of those particular signs, which again, I will not go through in detail. The notes that you will be given will indicate that specific information that you would um, want to have. But suffice it to say, there were specific signs and those signs were actually fulfilled because Jesus was making um, a prophetic revelation and, and Jesus, Jesus' prophecy would have to be accurate. It would be a prophecy that we can depend on and know that it would be fulfilled because Jesus is a true prophet. And so we, we do have record that precisely as Jesus indicated, those signs were fulfilled. So as I said, I am going to give you some notes which would give the specific um, fulfillment of each of those things that were identified. It's important to note that those were things that were actually fulfilled. And they were fulfilled with any generation that Jesus said it would occur. One very important verse that we need to pay attention to is where Jesus said in that chapter that all these things would be fulfilled with any generation that he was speaking to. Again, some people believe that he was speaking to a future generation that would be, at, would be alive when those things come to pass. No, we believe taken in the context that Jesus was speaking to that specific, um, particular generation that was before him. And he was also addressing the issue even before Matthew chapter 24. I'm pointing out to the Jews that he was speaking to that because of their disobedience and their rebellion, and because they killed the 
prophets that were sent to them and, and they oppressed the, the messengers that were sent, that judgment was going to come upon them. And so we believe that that judgment was what Jesus' prophet said would take place at the destruction of the temple, which occurred in AD 70. We, we did recognize also that there's some difficult passages in, in that particular text, which would make people inclined to believe that he could be speaking about a future fulfillment because the language that was used would probably mean that those things could not have been fulfilled already. When he talks about the moon not shining and the sun going in the darkness, the constellations falling from, from the sky. And I explained to you that that is a, is a prophetic or apocalyptic literature or language which Jesus was using, which compares to statements that were already used in the Old Testament. And I highlighted some passages that if you didn't note them, you could make a note of them now. But Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, that was speaking of the destruction of Babylon and the same type of language that Jesus used in Matthew was used in, in that context as well. And that was not something that was for a future to come. Babylon was destroyed and that same language was used. Then there was another passage referring to the destruction of Egypt that was in Ezekiel 32, 6 to 8. Similar language was used. And then we have Amos chapter 8, verse 9, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. You will see a similar language used there, and we will conclude from reading those passages that they were referring to something that was going to come in our future. There are things that were actually fulfilled, and the cities that were predicted to have been destroyed were destroyed. So we are seeing that in, in that particular context, Jesus was using a similar language to speak of the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. You also recognize that there was another term where Jesus was speaking about his coming on the clouds. And again, we might claim to believe that, that indeed the persons who predict that that could be something of the future could be plausible. But again, we showed from scriptural references that Jesus was using figurative language and that whenever you, you see the word coming mentioned in the Bible, it does not necessarily refer to the parousia, which is the Greek word used for the physical coming of Jesus, where he comes in bodily form, where every eye shall see him as has been mentioned in, in the Bible. But sometimes when the word coming is mentioned, it, mean com it means coming in judgment. And there are references also in, in the Bible where that term coming on the cloud is used. And one such example is in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. And then, then Jesus is speaking to Caiaphas, the high priest, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 64. He uses the same term coming on the cloud. And he was referring to coming in judgment, not making a physical appearance. And then in the book of Revelation, when he was speaking to the church at Ephesus, he said to them, if they don't repent, he will come and remove their candlestick. And obviously he did not mean coming in a physical bodily form, but he was coming in judgment. So in that context, we said that that explains what Jesus meant, and it was not necessary an application to his, his future um, coming in person at the end of the world. So, so therefore, we can conclude that Matthew chapter 24 speaks, yes, of destruction, yes, of a coming, a coming in judgment on the Jews who were disobedient, who were disrespectful, of the prophets and the messengers that were sent to them to warn them. I know Jesus says that judgment was going to come on them. And there's a parable in Matthew chapter 22. You can read that parable as well. And that would also spell out in detail 
what Jesus was referring to when he was speaking of the judgment that was to come. It was not of, of end of the world judgment, but it was a judgment that was coming upon the Church of Israel in terms of the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. Then we drew reference to another passage in Luke chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, where Jesus was addressing the same issue of how they killed the prophets and they stoned the people that were sent to them, and judgment was going to come on them. And then you also have another reference in Luke 19, 41 to 44. Then you also had Matthew chapter 23, 33 to 36, where he was speaking to them as the generation present, and he referred to them as the generation of papers, and asked how they should escape the damnation that was going to come on them. So that is a clear indication from those references that Jesus was speaking to the generation that would be alive at the time when the temple was destroyed, remember Jesus was crucified in AD 33, and before a 40 year generational period was passed, the temple was destroyed in AD 70, which means about 37 years after the prophecy was made, accurately and specifically, as Jesus indicated, the, the temple was destroyed and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. Thousands of people died. Thousands of Jews were carried away as slaves, which was also a prophecy that Jesus made. This is recorded in Josephus, and we do reference to a lot of the details which were recorded in Josephus. And a question was raised at the last session as whether or not whether or not Josephus may not have been exaggerated or used in hyperbole. As we mentioned, that hyperbole is a form of linguistic expression that has been used and is not to be taken literally, but it's an exaggeration that is used to, to really give an impression of the extent to which um, a particular situation is going to occur. And so the question was asked perhaps if Josephus, in his account, was not perhaps using hyperbole. Asked to check other references. I tried to do that, but amazingly, there were not a lot of um, other historians of ancient world that would have given an account of the destruction of Jerusalem. Tacitus, a Roman historian, mentioned about the destruction of Jerusalem. Somebody asked if we could have other accounts that were not Jewish. But Tacitus mentioned the destruction, but he did not give the type of detail that Josephus did because. We did identify the fact that Josephus was an eyewitness. He was living at the time. He went through the experience of the destruction. He saw the calamity and the distress, the famine, and the, the diseases. He, he saw um, family members going up against one another because of the destruction. He saw the army surrounding the city as Jesus predicted. He saw the, 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 the exodus of Christians who took the words of Jesus seriously and he instructed them. When they see these things begin to happen, so to flee from, from Judea. This is again an indication that he was speaking to a local group. He was not speaking to a universal situation. And that's why we were firm in our conclusion that Jesus was not speaking to intent events to come, but he was specifically speaking the destruction of Jerusalem and what those people would experience. He also used the language as, as if they're the house talk don't come down. If they're in the field, don't go back to take things. Meaning that he was speaking specifically to a group of people that would be alive at that time. And the, and the question that will come to mind is um, a sort of rebuttal to people who think that Jesus is speaking of, of, of the future way down the road. You would ask, why would he be so direct and specific to those people that he was speaking to and telling them to watch out for these things and giving us specific instructions to obey at the point in time, then to tell them that this is not going to happen in your time, it's going to happen maybe 2,000 years from now. That would not make much sense at all. So that's why we can be pretty emphatic in, the, in our conclusion that he was speaking 
to, to that generation and what they will experience in their own lifetime. Now, it is true that we can see signs comparable to those identified by Jesus. We did mention that. Or one time we see wars. We see a lot of conflict around the world. We see pandemics, diseases. We see famine across the world. So we see things that were parallel to what Jesus um, would have spoken of when he gave the signs to those people. And yes, we can be inclined to conclude but maybe they were for us. But the reality is, even though we might see signs that would be comparable, or fits in, in diverse places and whatnot, um, the famine, the pestilences, the diseases, the wars, and, and things of that nature, the reality was, and the fact was, and in the context of the whole passage, it was very clear that Jesus was speaking specifically to a localized group, and he was speaking to a specific situation and those signs were relevant to those people. They were to expect those things. They were to be signposts that they can look for and knowing that the time was to draw near. And we said that for people who question, well, what about the gospel being spread to the whole world? How would that fit into that time? They indicated then that remember the world then was basically the Roman Empire. And, and the world then will not have included in the world that would have discovered many years after. So a lot of the country that we'll be thinking of where the gospel has not reached would not have been relevant to that particular time. And they gave references where the Apostle Paul mentioned that indeed the gospel has spread to the uttermost parts of the earth. Remember the instruction that Jesus had given to his disciples when he was departing to, to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. And he also did mention that on the day of Pentecost, there were people gathered from about 16 different um, ethnic groups across the then known world. And they had come together in Jerusalem. And the Bible did indicate in Acts chapter 2 that they were gathered from all parts of the earth. And those people that got saved, 3,000 of them, but obviously would have gone back and spread the gospel to those parts of the world. So the possibility is really an truthfully, that what Jesus meant had actually happened. That he said that before the, the end of Jerusalem came, that the gospel would have been spread to the uttermost parts of the world. And, and in reality, that did happen. So all that Jesus prophesied did come to pass. And we believe that that is the teaching um, that, that we can hold on to from Matthew chapter 24. That is the, the Church of God perspective. That is what we will call the amillennial view. But remember, there are other views, and there are people who have other interpretations. And remember, as I said, because we should remember that because symbolic language is used, people are inclined to have a different interpretation. And so we're not saying that they are preaching heresy or, or that they are false prophets. It is just their particular interpretation. So the premillennial view differs completely from our particular view. But what we're saying is it's a matter of interpretation. But what I want is that we, we have a full understanding of why we believe what we believe. And that's why it's important to explain to you and try as much as possible in a simple and a specific, as detailed, and as comprehensive still, that you have a sound reason to, to, to justify your particular belief and be able to defend it. Because as the word instructs us, we should be able to give an answer when people question us about our faith. So you should know what you believe and why you believe it and be able to give an answer to that particular position. If you are questioned about your position on Matthew chapter 24, our position is that we believe that Jesus was speaking to the people that were present um, at the time he was speaking and would be present when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in that generation. And, and that's what he ended off that first theme with saying that there are those of you who will be standing here 
who will witness the fulfillment of all of these things. We believe that that is what he was specifically referring to. So what we want to do tonight, and I will pause there in case if anybody has um, any questions that they will want to ask or any statements they will want to make, if there's something that they may not be clarified, or if you have come across perhaps another phrase in any of the other parallel passages like Matthew chapter 13 or Luke chapter 21, because there are slight variations in the statements that are made those corresponding passages, the general theme is the same. Sometimes the expression in those particular passages are slightly, the expressions are slightly different from what you see. For example, somebody was, was, was mentioning about Luke saying, when you see these signs begin to happen, you look up for your redemption to join night. And that person was inclined to think, could that be speaking to us? When we see these signs, look up for our redemption is one night, and you will be looking at redemption now, and your, your transformation of the earth and your eternal salvation. But remember, the signs were referring to the signs that those people will see. So when that statement was made to look up for a redemption is one night, it was speaking to those people. And to look up means to take courage, it's that you don't walk with your head um, looking down, as if you're downtrodden, you're discouraged, you're despondent. It is saying to hold your head up high, be confident because something positive is going to happen out of this. Your redemption is one that he was speaking really to his disciples. And the fact that the, the changing from the old system of, of, of Judaism into the new covenant relationship with Christ and the establishment of, 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 of a better covenant, a better relationship, is speaking of a transformation and a change that will take place that will give them confidence that they can they can look up because they will not escape the persecution of the Jews because a lot of them would have been destroyed in, in, in that whole calamity. And now they can move to freely express and declare the gospel and, and, and preach with more freedom. So as I indicated, Matthew chapter 24 was, was not really an end to to the world, but it was the beginning of a new experience, which the disciples themselves would experience, and they would go out as messengers proclaiming the gospel. And they explained that when the word angels were used in terms of Jesus sending his angels to gather the elect, the word angel has also been translated as messenger from the Greek word that is used, that means that they are now going to be out after that tribulation. After that distress, after that destruction, they are going to be moving out you know, as, as an empowered group of people to carry the message to the ends of the world. But remember, there was a group of Christians that escaped, and Jesus had commanded, and they crossed the Jordan and went to a village um, city by the name of Tila, and then they established themselves as a strong, vibrant Christian group, and the, and the gospel spread from there as a result. Of the, the revive, the reviving in their spirit and the confidence which they had experienced as a result of their life being preserved by Christ because they obeyed his command and they took his instructions seriously. So I, I pause to give an opportunity for any questions or any statements before we proceed then to look at the second theme. All right, there being no questions, we will proceed. I want to pick up from verse 34. And in, and in this section, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reading a lot because we're, we're just going to be looking at the illustration that Jesus used and we're going to get a general understanding of what point he was making. Because we're not going to elaborate on the significance of the parables and go into the meaning of the parables and the details of the parables. What we're going to look at is what, what 
significant point Jesus was trying to make in response to the question that was asked. Remember, the second question is, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And they say the conclusion that can be drawn from that is that the disciples are associating the, the coming of Christ or the parousia, his physical return, his body return to the earth as the end of the world. And, and this obviously would contradict um, one of the contemporary views from the premillennialists that the coming of Christ is divided into two phases and it is not necessarily one return and that the end does not occur at his return. Life goes on. We made that point very clear that there are people who believe that life goes on. After the tribulation, there's going to be a millennial kingdom established and Christ will come back and reign for a thousand years on the earth. We are going to examine that in more detail and we go further on in our study. But we're not going to debate that now. But the second question is, is an indication that the disciples could possibly be linking. You might disagree with that, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reasonable um, position that you can hold if you conclude that the disciples could have been associating the coming of Christ with the end of the world. So they see an end when Christ returns. Uh, but they're, they're asking for signs. And Jesus' response, you will tell me whether you agree with what I am thinking, because I am thinking that he does not emphasize a lot of signs. Now, there was one brother who suggested to me that he thinks that the very first um, illustration that Jesus uses or, or the same um, comparison that he is going to make could be considered as a sign. This was the sign of no. And I will explain why the person thinks that that is the sign when we get there. So we pick up from verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And he was speaking to the generation that will be present at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass. He is saying that we can be confident in what he says, what he predicts. Heaven and earth will pass. And pay careful attention to that statement because that will come up later in our discussion about where we spend eternity. And, and Jesus is saying here, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass. Again, we're not going to go into that in any detail, but that's a key verse that you can pay attention to because it will come up in our dialogue in further discussions. He picks up, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. So there's a change of tone. There's an indication that he is responding now to the second question. First question has been answered, and Jesus says, Now, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man. Now, by comparison, remember that in the, in the first team, he was talking about those days, in those days. But he's saying now, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man. So you can definitely see that he, he, He's addressing this, the second theme, and, and there's, a, there's a difference already that is indicated. But of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Which means, if he's addressing the second question, he's saying that nobody knows the day or the hour, so there can't be any predictions of things because you don't know the day or the hour. Before Jesus gave signs, which means that you can watch, you can analyze what is happening. And he gave the parable of the fig tree. He says, when you see the fig tree begin to blossom, you know that summer is near. And in the same way, when you see those things begin to unfold before you, which I predict will unfold, you know that the time is near for the end of the, of the temple and the destruction of the city, as I have predicted. But here he's saying, no man knows the, the or not even the angels, nor angels in heaven, but my father only. 
But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He's talking about the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man. And the person that had indicated to me that there's a possibility that we could consider this as a sign, because I said that I, I don't really see any specific signs that he gave in the first team talking about destruction of the city. He said that you could consider this as a sign because he's saying, as the days of no work, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So it means then that you would have to know something about the days of no. And then if you get an understanding of what those days of no were like, and you see the parallel to this in our time, then you would have an indication that we, we, we have some show that we could be in a time which Jesus would have been illustrating from that reference. And that could be plausibly considered as a sign. So I, I, I would give um, some leeway to that consideration. And I would even ask at this point, because Jesus mentions here what he was specifically referring to, but there, there are possibilities, or there's a possibility that there could be other things that even though Jesus did not mention them, that could be considered as part of the experience of the, of the days of no. For as the days, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that no entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the, come, the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, my understanding of this is, is that Jesus is making a, com a comparison to the experience that those people had in that they were dealing with their own affairs, the things that people would normally be engaged in, and he mentions some, of course, this is not all they would have been engaged in, eating and drinking and marrying. And obviously this is not the only thing that could be applicable to the days of Noah. And that's where the individual believes that there could be things that were relevant to Noah's time that could be possibly an indication of the nature of the people and the experiences that happen before Christ returns in, in our world. And, and, and this could be a signal of, of something to come. And that's where the person said that that could possibly be a sign. And that is, that is reasonable. But, but my uh, specific understanding here is that Jesus was saying, in those time, those people paid no heed basically to the preaching that no was giving. They were engaged in their own activities, their own affairs, and the own matters that concerned them. I were only aware when the flood came that what Noah was preaching about and what was prophesied that would come on the world was now on them. And that is what I believe Jesus is saying would happen in our time coming to the end of the world and his return. That people will be engaged in their normal affairs, going on with their own business affairs. Many people, obviously, the unsaved, not paying attention because those are the ones that were taken away. The unsaved ones are the ones that were taken away. We just, that's that way we're looking at the whole concept of rapture, and we're not going to go through the details of, of these verses again. But just to mention it here again, the, the ones that were taken away were the unsaved. Noah and his family were saved. Now, I asked the question before, do you have any idea from extra reading? Because remember, I told you that there are accounts given from extra biblical texts where you get details about things. Like, for example, in, in, the, in the time of Noah, there were, there were details written in the book of Enoch and the other books that give details that the Bible does not give. The Bible does not go into a lot of details but what the days of no were like. I was, I was asking the question, if there are any of you who have any ideas of what you think those days were like that could possibly be repeated in our time, that could be considered then as signs that would bring us to a realization 
if Jesus says, as the days of no work, and so we get more details, we could have an idea that it possibly could be a repeat of some of those things in human behavior and human experiences. Is there any information that anybody can bring to the, to the table about what the days of no work like? any application that you can make from that particular illustration. And it's very possible that we can look for some of those things as possible signs. All right, again, we move on. For as in those days they were before the flood, were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that go entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came. They knew not. They were, in other words, there was there was nothing to give them any indication that the flood was going to come. That's what I, I believe that there, there are really no signs. There was no indication whatsoever. And took them all away. So shall it be at his coming. And it goes on to say, then two shall be in a field, and the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at a mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And we indicated that while people might use that to justify a rapture, that is just really part of the illustration that Jesus is using. It is that people are not aware of what is happening. They're going on in their normal duties. He's just adding some other things that people will be engaged in, normal life as as. As, as we are engaged, and we will see the Son of Man coming. We will realize that, that there is an end to the world. Like the people only realized that there was a flood when there was a flood on them. When the rain started descending and the water started to rise, they had no indication, no idea at all of what was going to come. Only what was predicted by, by Noah and they refused. I believe that that is what Jesus is trying to illustrate here, that people will be engaged in their activities and then there will be a separation. Because when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a separation of the just from the unjust, the righteous from the unrighteous, the weak from the tears. These are other illustrations that are given in parables and that separation is going to take place at the end of the world. And watch, watch what statement is made here. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. The emphasis is on not knowing. This is a, a, a marked contrast to what went before. That's why we say that those signs were referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, not to the end of the world. Because Jesus says there's, there's not going to be any signs, there's going to be no indication. So, what the, the emphasis here is. Is to be watchful, to be on the lookout, because you do not know when Christ is going to come. And as we go through 24 and, the 20 and 25, you will see that that's the general concept that is coming out as we, we analyze um, and examine the, the parables. In the, in the first thing, the warning is to not be deceived. Be not deceived. They're going to come false prophets. They're going to come people pretending to be the Christ, don't listen to them. There's, there's going to be a, 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 an attempt to deceive you and leave, lead you astray. That's where the emphasis was on not being deceived. Be aware of what I tell you. These are the signs to be looking for and you will get an understanding as my people, as my followers, that you have an indication that what I'm, I'm, our prophet said is going to come to pass. And that's why we are reminded that we are in the light and therefore, we should not be caught on the rear because we should always be in a state of preparedness and expectation. And I, I believe that this is the emphasis that Jesus is making in relation to his coming. Since nobody knows the hour and nobody knows the time, not even the angels in heaven. So we can't know. People of the premillennial persuasion have made predictions from way back since 1948 because they were looking 
for signs because they interpreted Matthew 24 to be signs that we should be looking for. So from the time these signs started to appear, they started to make predictions. And that's why he said they should be examining their theology because according to their predictions, the rapture should have long taken place. Since the, the things that they indicated, if there were signs, Jesus says, when you see these things begin to happen, know for certain that it is at your door, right? It is right on you. So it means that there cannot be a long period of time if you see these signs being fulfilled. And that's my line of argument. If the signs that they are looking for have been identified, then we should have seen the rapture because they were arguing that the rapture is imminent, which means that any time from, from the time that they started to predict the rapture, it could have occurred. Now we have passed a generation already and we have not seen the rapture occur. So which means that that should bring them to our, our, our reconsideration and re-examination of their particular theological um, position. Now, you might find that I'm repeating things. Yes, I'm repeating so that you remember some of the significant points that they register in your mind and that, that you are able to retain them. That's, that's the reason why I'm repeating because it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an important principle in getting people to learn things by, by repeating them. You, you tend to understand a little better and grasp them um, a little more. So that's why I mentioned those things so that you are you, you link that interpretation with what Jesus actually says that we can we can have um, something to compare it with. So watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. We'll go on to another parable. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. I, I need to explain that for you. He, um, the good man of the house, and what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. Now, the, now the term watch in the Jewish context is, is what they use for the, the night time. They did divided the 12 hours day, 12 hours darkness. The, the day time period is referred to as, as the hours. So you talk about the first hour of the day. So the first hour after sunrise, would be like in our time from from six o'clock if some raises that six o'clock from six to seven at the first hour from seven to eight the second hour and from eight to nine the third hour of the day that's how they would, would give their time so the day time would have been in hours but when it comes to the evening time now after sunset going into night from the time the sun sets that we're going to the first watch so the first watch will be from six to seven p.m second watch should be from seven to eight so what, what Jesus is saying here is if, if the good man of the house knew what watch, which means what time of the night the thief was coming, then he would have watched. He would have been on the lookout. If he knew when the thief was coming, I noticed he's, he's, he's coming the night, but of course the thief is coming the day. But Jesus is saying um, in this reference here, the watch the night time is, is normally the, the time that you, you tend to find that people would want to do evil. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. So he would have watched and he wouldn't he would not have suffered his house to be broken into. Therefore, watch the team again. Therefore, be also ready. For in as such an hour as he think not, the Son of Man cometh. Notice the reference to coming. The Son of Man coming in verse 39. The Son of Man coming in, in 42. And now reference again to the Son of Man coming. In 44. So, so why the disciples were asking for a sign of his coming? Notice Jesus has given illustrations and what point he's making here significantly is to be on the watch, to be on guard, to be on the lookout, because you do not know. Don't be looking for any signs. Just be prepared. Because the coming could represent your death. Your, your separation from this world, not necessarily Jesus' uh, parousia, because many of us could be dead by name. We might not be alive when Christ is returning in physical body form. So we have to be living in a state of preparedness that, that we, could, we could be called from this world. We, we could go from this world in, in, in death, 
And so we will not have a chance even to be looking for any signs to come. So we have to be ready. Verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, watch the language again, finds so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. He shall be rewarded at his coming. Pay careful attention to that. You're going to see some, some significant point being made here in these illustrations, and these parables that Jesus is using that speak significantly about things of eschatology. He is going to reward, right? I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, he gets complacent, he loses focus, he engaged in all sorts of activities other than preparedness, just as it was any time of no. Those people were engaged in all sorts of things and not preparing for a flood which was predicted which was prophesied. Jesus said he's going to return again to this earth. That has been prophesied. It is going to happen. And we have to be prepared for it. So Jesus says that, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in that day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. I think Luke said the unfaithful. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, watch the language, watch the context, watch the point that Jesus is illustrating. We're not, we're not going to go into the application of, of, of the parables, as they said, what they mean. But look at what specific teaching that Jesus is making, what point he is, is, is addressing in relation to his coming, because that's the question he's answering. Notice there are no signs. It is an unexpected arrival of the master, of the Lord, and people are caught in an unprepared situation, and Jesus is here telling his disciples, because he was speaking to them um, specifically because they took him away in privacy and asked him these questions. We move to chapter 25. If there are any statements, I pause again. If there are any comments that anybody wants to make, if there are any queries, if there's any opposing view on what we, what I have been perhaps indicating so far in relation to how we see this response to the second question. Um, Implications of it, you can you can say. And I just want to pause for a few seconds. Don't forget, if you want to ask a question, you have to un unmute the phone. You want to make a statement. Hi, Hi good night. Um, I was just wanting to know about um, just to go back over verse 40, 40 and forty-one. Uh, I think I need a yes. little bit more clarification on that. You're saying that that is speaking uh, more of judgment and separation, basically. Then shall two be in a field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. And I think in the Luke passage that mentions another one, two shall be in the bed, one shall be taken and another left. Now, I am saying that Jesus is giving an illustration here. He is speaking about the unexpected. As it was in the days of Noah, people did not expect a flood, but one came and they were not prepared for it. The, the illustration that Jesus is using here is, he's saying it is like this. It is like two people at a mill bringing one taken and another left. Now, that is something that you will least expect, that you are in a normal activity and somebody suddenly disappears from, from beside you. That's one application of it. It, 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 is a, it is a surprise to an event, an unexpected 
um, result that occurs. Jesus said this coming is like that. It's going to be unexpected. You are going to be engaged and it's going to be a surprise when it does happen. And maybe more to a large degree to the unsaved because the word keep reminds, reminded us that it shall not come to us on the rear because we are in the light and we should be living in a prepared state in a prepared condition. So we should be looking for and hastening onto that glorious day. And Peter reminds us that we should be living our lives in, 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 in that context. So I, I'm also saying it could be, it could be an illustration of a separation that will occur as well at the end when Christ comes. Separation: one shall be taken and another left. There's there's a separation. It does not indicate where they will be taken. I mentioned that the last time. Some people believe that this means that is a rapture and that the ones that are taken are taken to heaven with Christ. And the one that remains is the one that remains on the earth, which obviously would mean it's the unsaved person. The text does not tell us the, 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 the righteousness of the, of the individual. It does not tell us the religious standing. Just say two shall be at the middle, grinding one thing they have left. So we can't conclude with, with any certainty that Jesus is addressing um, a rapture here where you are taking away a Christian and leaving it unsaved because there's no indication of that in the text. It just says one taken and the other left. And the illustration that Jesus used with the days of Noah, the, the, what we said, those who were taken were, were, the, were the unrighteous. Those who remained that were saved in the ark were the righteous. So we cannot even make that sort of analogy um, in, in comparing these two. But as I said, it's an illustration and people have different interpretations of it. So I'm saying, you can look at it two ways. One, the unexpectedness of an event and that two people are together and you just see somebody disappear from, from next to you. Obviously, that's a surprise. That's an unexpected event. You don't, you are not looking for that. You, you least expect that to happen. Jesus is, is saying that. And notice all the time, the other illustrations are being given. That's why I believe it's a comparison. Be using an unawareness. The servant begin to live as he like and beat the, 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 the others and, and, and get, and get in drunkenness until the Lord comes and he didn't expect the Lord to be coming. That is the sort of illustration. But if you want to, to, to use it in the context of, a, of an end event in relation to Christ coming, this could also be an illustration of a separation that will occur. Because remember Jesus says, coming on to the end, that he will send his angels in this term now, in this context, he can mean the actual angels to, to separate the sheep from the goat, separate the saved from the unsaved, separate the wheat from the fears. And this could be an illustration of that separation, one taken and the other left, meaning that one is taken and the other remains because they're going to be going separate places. They're going to be in separate groupings. That is how that illustration could be used here. And I said a third way that people look at it is in connection to the rapture, but we can't conclude um, that from the illustration because it does not say specifically that a righteous person is taken and an unsaved left. I don't know if that clarifies things to you because we can't be dogmatic about this particular passage here because there are illustrations being used and people, people interpret illustrations in different ways. So I'm giving you different positions on it and I'm giving you the one I'm particularly inclined to accept that Jesus is just using an illustration to show the unexpected nature of his arrival and, and, and the analogy that he's using here is just to illustrate that particular fact, but, but he's not speaking of a rapture as some people interpret it to mean. Yes, thanks. Okay. All right, notice another point in 50 and 51. Again, significant. The illustration, take, take, and, and, and take this as, as I'm trying to point out, these are illustrations being used, but significant points can be drawn from the illustration. And as I say, people can have different interpretations of them because they, they are open to interpretation. But I, I, I believe that we can, we can draw things that we can stand by because they are made clear. Even though they're parables, they are simple. 
and, and the, the context of them we can understand easily. So this one indicates that when the Lord comes, he rewards the good servant and he punishes the bad one. Indicating again that when Jesus comes, there is going to be a separation. There is going to be a judgment. There is going to be reward and punishment. Again, that contradicts the premillennial position, which believes that judgment takes place at different times, in different places. And so everybody is not called to stand at the judgment seat when Christ returns. They believe that one judgment will take place in heaven for the Christians who have been raptured, and another judgment will take place at the end of the millennium when all the unsaved are resurrected, and they call it a great return judgment. This illustration here again shows me that when the Lord returns, he rewards the faithful and judges the unfaithful. At the same time, there's no separation here. That is what I believe is, is a reasonable and, and a good conclusion to be drawn from that, which will support our theological perspective. But we see one general judgment, one general resurrection, one coming of Christ, not two phases. So again, I'm repeating these that they register in your head. But you understand what is the Church of God um, perspective? The Church of God Reformation movement, what is our theological perspective and what do we differ from other people and, and what we are using as our basis and if it's reasonable and if we can stand by it. And I, I think to a large measure it is. So we see one resurrection, one judgment, one appearance of Christ, chapter 25. So we'll be able to conclude um, the whole of the Second, second theme. Then the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Remember, I told you that the Olivet discourse carries on from 24 into 25. Jesus is still speaking. Five of them were wise, and the five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and put no oil in them, but the wise took oil in their vessels, their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried. They all slumbered and slept. While well, the bridegroom tarried, notice again, the master went away for a time. The bridegroom is tarrying. The illustration here, Jesus has gone away, which we well know, but he's going to return. People get complacent because there is a tarrying. There is a delay. People say Christ was coming ever since and we didn't see him come yet. So they get complacent. They, 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 do, not get, they do not focus on on what has been predicted and what has been prophesied and what is, is going to happen and they lose their way. So while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry. Notice all of them slept. The wise slept and the foolish slept. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for the lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch the instruction again. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Watch the language again. After each of the parables, we're not going to go into detail of, of what the, the, the parable means and the, the whole culture of it. That is for sermon. But for our Bible study purposes, we just use it as an illustration and watch the point is taken at the end of the illustration. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling, I'm at verse 14, now into a far country. Notice again, somebody goes away. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. 
And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several abilities, and straightway he took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went out, went and traded with the same, and made them another five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that had received one went and dig in the earth and hid his large money. After a long time, watch the language again, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. He cometh and reckoneth with them. There is accountability when the Lord returns. Folks, keep this in mind all the way. Watch the language, watch the context, watch the, the statements that are being made. What, and watch the instructions that are being given. They are important things that Jesus illustrated here, all in connection to his coming. And these all tie in together and they build a significant point. So far, no signs. There is an unawareness, there is an, an, an expectedness. And the, 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 the person has gone away and returned, just like Jesus has gone away from his disciples and he told us he's going to come again. He is coming. It might seem long. Like he's gone away for a long time or he delays this story is coming as illustrated in the other parable but he comes to reckon with them again there is an assessment there is an evaluation there's a judgment when he comes and so he that have received the five talents came and brought another five talents saying lord thou deliverest unto me five talents behold i have gained beside them five talents more his lord said unto him well done Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Reward, folks. There's a reward at the coming. When the master returns, you get the reward at the return. You're not taken away to receive it. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, Thou so deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside him. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee a ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of my Lord. Not of the same um, caliber, but he was faithful with what he had. He didn't have the same amount, but he was faithful with what he had. He rewarded for his faithfulness. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not shown. And I was afraid, and then I hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there hast thine, so lo, thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap not where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strewed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming, I shall have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which have ten talents. For every for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. Uh, but from him that have not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, there is an assessment and evaluation and a judgment. There's a reward and there's a punishment. We're not going to go in. It's another sermon on the talents, but we're not dealing with what it actually means. We are just using the illustration that Jesus is using, the context he's using it, and the purpose behind which, which he's using it. He's answering the question, what shall be the sign of the coming and the end of the world? He gave no signs, but he's given illustration as to his going away, his return, and the unexpected nature of his return. That's why I believe all of these are parallel. Answer the, the other brother by the question that was asking about who shall be in the field and, and at the middle is the same type of illustration. It's an unexpected, unprepared condition that we will 
we'll find ourselves in if we are not planning and looking for as people of the light. So this is sending a serious message. Um, while we think about eschatology, it is more to it than just a Bible study. Jesus is addressing a serious issue here of, of a promise that was made. He has gone, he is going to return. All these illustrations here is indicating that um, people are going to be caught in an unprepared condition. And several of them are going to receive a, a, a damnation and a punishment and a reward that fits the fact that they ignored the warnings that were given. They ignored the advice and instruction, just like the Jews could be compared to that. They ignored the prophets. They ignored the disciples. They, they persecuted them. They, they put them in, um, in, in, in prison. They drew them before the council. They, they even caused um, their death. And even Jesus himself came as the final prophet, and they rejected him and crucified him. And their judgment came right in their generation. And, and in the future, yes, they're going to receive another judgment for their complacency and for their lack of attentiveness to what mattered. This is important, folks, and we, we need to pay attention to that as a serious element of this whole um, teaching on eschatology. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Now, I believe now that this is the parousia. This coming now, and he does not mention coming in the clouds. He says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. This is this this is the is the, is the consummation of this is the climax. This is the this is the end. So when when the term end was mentioned in the first theme, Jesus was referring to the end of Jerusalem, the end of that city, the end of that era, the end of that dispensation, and a, and a new beginning. This one here now is, is, is the end of all things, as, as Paul puts it in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we discuss. When he comes and he hands over the kingdom to his father, he brings an end to all things and to the final enemy, which is death. This is the end here that we are speaking of now. And there's separation. And then the king, Say unto them on the right, Come, be blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All of this um, is, is a sort of summary now of all the parables that went before. That when the, when the master came back, there was a reward and there was a judgment. And Jesus is, is making the conclusion here. You know, he, he, he's is, 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 um, giving the summary. For I was. Oh, sorry. Then shall the king say unto them, Come on my right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, for the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat, I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, I was a stranger, and you took me naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, I hungered, and led thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink. Then saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in the prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye curse, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice again the summary. He, he, he is concluding here now from all the illustrations that he has given to us, where there was a return of the Lord or the master or the Bible, and there, there is a reward for those who are faithful, and there is a negative result for those who have not been faithful. And he had drawn in the final conclusion of this is what is going to be like at my coming. No signs, you just 
prepare yourself and watch because it's going to happen when you least expect it because the angels don't know. It was reserved from me as in my human body on the earth. What Jesus was saying, but of course in heaven at the right hand of the Pharisee, then it's going, he knows when that time is going to be. But he indicated that he was on earth, that that was not part of the knowledge that would have been made available to him. That was kept reserved. And so, as I said, people who are making predictions really cannot be in the right place. And from, from all the illustrations here, we don't see any indication of a specific time period, and we do not see any signs. So the same question is going to be asked when, um, for I was hungry and you gave me no meat, I was thirsty, you gave me no drink, I was a stranger and you took me not in, naked, and you clothed me not, sick and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungry or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, he did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Very conclusive. Parables are simple. There's not um, a lot of um, language that you can't understand, a lot of, a lot of hyperbole, um, or figurative language. There are parables, yes, they're just illustrations, but they, they, they make very clear and very specific points, and we can draw conclusions. We can draw conclusions the accurate conclusions from the parables that Jesus used. And he gave us a number of them, and then he at the end drew a conclusion. I am going to return to this earth, to this earth. And I'm going to sit up on my throne for glory. And I'm going to have a universal judgment. We're not going to debate on how this will be done. As I indicated, all others worry about that. Oh, it is going to be done in mind, which is going to be done in, in a moment and a train of an eye. A lot of things can happen with God. It doesn't, it doesn't take time in, in terms of, of the way we know time. This can all happen in an instant. Where, where Jesus evaluates, makes an assessment and judge because the report is already being taken. As I indicated before, while Revelation talks about books being open and the small and the great stand before God to be judged, God is not coming back with any big book to open. That was figurative language because God does not need a book. But all it now we are being assessed. God knows all our thoughts, all our actions, even before we, we, we complete them. So an assessment will be made of every human being even before Jesus gets back to the earth. So the, the standing in his presence and being judged is, is, is that our works, our life will be evaluated, then a judgment will be made at that point in time. And so I think we have a clear position to stand on. In terms of our theological perspective, which, which I believe can sub, is substantiated on what we read in Matthew chapter 24 and in 25, and said part in 23, because before he, he went out to the temple to the Mount of Olives, he addressed specific issues related to that generation. He, he, he passed certain words on them and judgment. And he went into the Mount of Olives and proceeded to respond to questions that the disciples asked to get more details. Jesus gave them some specific details in relation to the Temple of Jerusalem. He gave them signs. But to the second question, he gave them illustrations that point significantly to the unexpected nature of his return. It's all about preparedness. You see, when people start looking for signs, they, they start then planning and doing things in relation to signs. God does not want that. He wants us to prepare. You see, the Jerusalem thing was a specific event for a specific time, a specific locality. What Jesus is answering in the second, um, to the second question is, is universal. It is, it's going to apply to everybody. And we all have to prepare for that moment. I believe that that is what Jesus was saying, what he was answering. And so I will conclude 
that the signs that are given in Matthew 24 were not directly given for us to be looking for in our time. Jesus is telling us that clearly in chapter 25 and part of 24. You won't be looking for signs. Those signs were specifically related to the destruction of Jerusalem. I repeat that again. Yes, we can see certain things happening in our time that we could figure are comparative to what happened at the destruction of Jerusalem. And maybe, as some people say, there could be a secondary application. But Jesus is not telling us to look for any signs. I don't think he, he's speaking to us directly. He was speaking to that um, group of people directly in that generation. I believe what he's saying to us directly now, this is the universal element of it. Be prepared. Be uh, ready. Reverend Jackman? Yes. Reverend Jackman, excuse me one sec. You have a question from uh, Richard? Percy yes. Ball. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, good night, Father Jackman. And good night, um, to the listening audience. Good night my, to you. My question is this. Um, I have doing a list of studies and listen to some um, other commentators. And I want to ask this question. How important it is with the concept of the belief of the pre-millennium, post-millennium, or half millennium. My, my thing is, this is, is that if you're a Christian and you yeah. live in your life uh, in accordance to God's standard and holding to the God word, you won't got really um the 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 concept of the interpretation from various creatures is not really important. That's how I believe it because I listen to, to you and over the years when I was growing up I listened to a different interpretation than what you believe in but and, and I have concluded not only now a long time ago that if you, live, live, if you live for God the right way and you die and, and, and God, your redemption is sure. So you don't got to worry that if you get left behind, if you get left in front, you're going with God. That, that, that is my take on this, on this whole thing. But I will share, I will share that with you, Richard, with, um, just to some degree, yes. The, the emphasis is not on, on theology, but the fact is that these are things that are part of the of the of the literature that we have been given. The, the Lord has left the word for us. People have been given prophecies; they have been recorded, and we read the word. And we have to understand what they mean. We have to interpret it. So it's important for us. Also, people challenge the, the Bible. They, they challenge the the, um, the veracity of the Bible. They challenge the, the, um, the authenticity of the Bible. Um, and they, they challenge a, a whole lot of things about the Bible. So we have to study the word because there are people that are, are going to question us concerning certain things about, about the word. There are people that make predictions. There are people that, that, that interpret things and, and say things in relation to the Bible that cause controversy and that cause people to, to question and challenge the Bible. So we have to know because we have to give people answers when they question us about things. For us, as, a rightfully, as you rightfully said, as, as the word points out, it should not come to us on the rear because we should be living in a prepared situation. But but we, we have to bear in mind that we have to understand what is written to us. And, and while we might think that it is, is not relevant to us now, we, we got in a prepared condition. What happens to those people who believe that you have another opportunity after Christ returns? and live in a place of complacency because they say, well, I don't know when the master is returning, but the fact remains is that there are theologians that tell me that when the master returns, he is going to take away a set of people and, and leave the unsafe, and I therefore will have a chance to get saved. So while, while practically it might, it might not mean anything to, to us now, at that time, if that was to happen, you would be giving people a, a, a belief that they have an opportunity to be saved. You see, so, so theology is important. 
and, and what we teach people is significant that we, 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 we let people understand what the Bible actually teaches in relation to the final event, that they will not be complacent, they will not play the fool, like that servant, eat and drink and, and, and get drunken, and then it is it is it's got on the rear. So so this is where the eschatology is important for us teaching people what they need to understand. But us who are Christians, just like what what the um the signs were for the for the people who, who live at, and in, in the Jewish time. They might have considered, well, but these things are not really significant. But the, the Christian that took Jesus seriously left Jerusalem and escaped a lot of damnation. If there were Christians that remained and did not take what was, was given serious, some of them would have died in that, in, that, in that calamity. Some of them would have gone through the horror and the suffering and the, and, and the famine. So, so this is still relevant. It still has context. It is still important because it is part of the word. And it is relevant to us. In the final analysis, yes, overall, I agree. It's not how much we know, what we know, but is that we are in a prepared condition because we could have all the understanding of eschatology and still not be saved because we have not taken things seriously as, as how we ought to have taken them. But the thing, I understand you, right? I, I understand you, and, and I, I, I grasp the, the, the explanation, but yeah, I I still I still is not really convinced and doubt yet the be between the the post millennium and the pre millennium concept because as I tell you I grew up in a church where all my life that was preached to me so I, I have concluded to my own study when I talk when I talk to God on a day to day basis and I let God knows what I stand and and. God has revealed certain things, certain things to me and give me a more understanding of, of where he is in me and, and I in him. So I'm saying if every person put God first and ask God for that insight and, and understanding, it won't really matter. It won't really matter where we're or who, who is right and who's wrong or that how I see it. I, I, I be wrong, but that's how I see because every person can, can come to you and can try to convince you that the pre-millennial is right, the post-millennial is right, the half-millennial is right, but in the end, it is what God reveals to you and how you perceive it because when, when you die and you die, you die in Christ, you go, you go on with him. Is the person that is the person that that in in, in, in far away Christ who are hardly is who got to worry about this. Not, not a person that far away Christ who are hardly. Agreed, agreed, Richard. So so we don't need to, to repeat that point. We we get the point that you're making. But but, but what I'm saying is. In the final analysis, there's only one truth. Right. And one sometimes truth. people, yeah, there's only one truth. So everybody can't be right. And it's just a matter of us trying to come aggressively word and be willing sometimes to change a perspective that you may have. Now, I'm, I, I, I'm indicated to you already that there are several people who were educated in premillennialism and they changed their views. I'm talking about doctors in theology. You, 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 you seldom find persons who were are millennialists change and become pre-millennialists. You don't, you don't, you different happening. But a, a lot of the accounts that you read that there's a change, there are people who have who have been taught pre-millennialism, pre-millennialism, but they say when they study the word and get a full understanding of the word and open to the, the, the scripture rather than trying to defend a, a position, they change from that position. So there's still something significant about, about understanding the word and, and allowing allowing it to, to speak to you and not saying that I was taught this position, I will hold on to it. And, and, and God can't reveal different things to different people that are not truth. He has to reveal truth and truth alone. It is just a matter of us trying to make adjustments that accommodate that truth. God is going to reveal one truth to you, Richard, and one truth to, in relation to me. Uh, one truth in relation to me in relation to his coming. There has to be a specific truth that is right and that great. 
That's all I'm saying. And we, and we just need to try to get to understand that and be willing to make adjustments where we see. We need to make adjustments to accommodate that truth. Uh, all right, it's five after. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I know we are over by a few minutes, but there's another question here in the chat. And, all right. And the person is asking, since Jesus and the Father are one, and they have, according to John 10, 30, huh? that's the text they have cited. Why did Jesus say in Matthew 24, 36, that only the Father knows the day or the hour? Jesus and the Father are one. Yes, we understand that. And that's that's the overall concept of the, of the Trinity. And But we just got to bear in mind that there was a difference when Christ came to earth. Because the, the, the Father didn't die. The Father didn't go through the human experience that Jesus went through. And God doesn't hunger and thirst and get tired and bleed. Jesus did. So we've got to accept the fact that, that there, is, there is a difference in Jesus coming on the earth as distinct from him being in, in, in union with the the go ahead from the beginning and, and, and in reality in his, his, his existence after he left the earth. Jesus made the comment, I did not make it. He said he does not know. I have to take that as he said it unless there's a problem with the translation and we have to go back. Which means that since there were limitations in Jesus' body while he was on earth, there were limitations. Yes, he performed miracles. He demonstrated the deity because um, Christ was was God incarnate. But he, he was fully man and, and fully God, and we don't understand the, 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 the fullness of that. It's, it's, it's a complex issue. But the fact is that Jesus did things that God spirit wouldn't do because God is spirit. And God is not eating. God was not um, fierce. Jesus was in a physical body. So I am saying is that what he was saying is that that would not have been part of, of the information that he would have been privy to as in his human body. And he said that, and that's all we can conclude. That does not take away from the fact that, that Jesus and the Father are one. That's in, that's in eternity. And, and that's what it has always been. But remember, Jesus made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was made um, in, in human form and came down to us. So that means that part of what he was with me clothed in, in terms of his overall deity would have been compromised in a sense that he took on human and then therefore he could not have been in the same sense as, as God the Father who is in spirit form. So it's just for us to, to take that as it is. I, I don't try to figure it out, but, but because Jesus said it, and I just uh, have that said that that's what he meant. And uh, as it indicated, after he just ascended into heaven, back to the Father, that information will be available to him. He would know. But he said while he was on earth, that information was not privy to him. People are, are trying to wrap their heads around that. And as I said in, in the last session, that's why Jehovah's Witnesses argue that Jesus could not have been God because God knows everything. But you see, you have to, you have to see Jesus on earth as different. That's why we, we, that's why we often refer to him as the son of God. But in the full essence of the word, Jesus is God, not just the son of God, but that's in the light in which he was referred and he, he was revealed to us on earth, born as a babe and grew up as a man. So that's my response to that. All right, so it's 10 after. So I just want to say thanks again to um, all of you who were involved in the discussion. And I just want you to, to understand that the study of the word um, is important.
not not just for eschatology because eschatology is going to involve Christians nearly. So I hope that, that we can continue this sort of dialogue and look at some other important things which we have to defend in relation to our faith because we are we are always being challenged and there are critics of the Bible. There there are people who are opposed to what we believe. And, and we have to be constantly studying. I hope that we'll be able to engage ourselves in other topics like relation to creation and evolution and our, our human sexuality and things of, in relation to the history of, of the Bible and accounts that were given in Noah's flood and Jews in Egypt and things that people question. And all of those things are, are things that we have to study and they are important to us because we have to defend our faith and their people are challenging us and we have to, to, to contend for the faith. So but the study is very important and as college is only one after of it, we must engage ourselves as students of the word and make sure we are able to defend our faith and give answers that people can trust the Bible, see that it's reliable and it's authentic. And it is the word of God and we can rely on it. Amen. So, we're looking forward for our next session, which will be two weeks away. Um, and we're going to pick up now on the Antichrist. That's another heavy topic, and that's going to involve a lot of discussion and research. We're going to be looking at Daniel and, and Revelation. So that is going to be an interesting study. And we, we want you know, as many people as possible to be in on that one. So God bless you and have a good night. All right. So just before.